probably going to get some more uh, people. Really, you know, I understand there's a computers are down or something. People are kind of scrambling upstairs. But so let me uh, introduce our speaker for uh, it's, it's our first seminar I think of the year. Um, Sean Brennan. Uh, I think the most important uh, feature here is that he's a PhD mechanical engineering grad at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, our sister campus. Yeah. Um, Just there yesterday. He also has an MS in mechanical engineering, a BS in mechanical engineering, and a BS in physics. Uh, Sean is currently uh, an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Penn State. I had the pleasure of meeting Sean when I was out in Altoona. Actually, I enjoyed our, our visit at Penn State a little more. That's good. But, um, and we had a nice conversation, particularly on this topic that he's going to speak to us today, the um, uh, automation or uh, autonomous vehicles. And he will uh, discuss the challenges uh, that he sees uh, in this emerging technology, which is a very hot topic. And uh, we'll get a sense for uh, how soon we can expect it to actually show up in a big way. Sean? Steve, thank you very much. Um, and thank you everybody for attending the seminar. Uh, again, um, you know, I've, I was in the area. We have the actually um, uh, IROS uh, Robotics um, and Systems Conference. Uh, it was in Chicago uh, this past week, on Monday through Wednesday. And so this is my first return to the, the, the um, Illinois area uh, since it's been out. So it's been a real true homecoming for me. And so I'm giving a seminar that's similar to one that's yesterday. Yesterday I gave this a similar talk to systems faculty. It was very theoretical. And so if you want to jump into equations, I can pull up in that other uh, presentation. But today I want to talk about more of a general overview of the area as well as getting into some more detail about the future challenges because I think uh, um, it's especially more important for this audience. Um, I'm assuming a lot of people here are familiar with transportation uh, research needs and transportation challenges. Um, you know, just to recap, we have issues with uh, congestion, environmental uh, uh, concerns, um, driver distraction is becoming a, a large issue, uh, the aging uh, um, driver population. I work a lot with uh, heavy trucking and the notion of just-in-time delivery and fleet ownership of vehicles is, is something quite relevant to uh, automation. Um, and then we're seeing uh, changing ownership patterns. Uh, when Ed and I were walking around here this morning, we were just looking around at all the zip cars parked in the neighborhood. And you see, in particular, um, a demographic change. And I was telling uh, Ed that I teach a vehicle dynamics course for the senior students in our undergraduate program um, choose an elective, and, and I teach their one of their last classes. And it's the first time in my career where I've asked people how many have a car, and um, a third of the class did not own a vehicle um, within my course. So typically, this is a, a class where students own two or three vehicles, and we're we're seeing very dramatic. Uh, Changes. Now, in terms of um, me, I often have to go through uh, a challenge, especially with my mom, of convincing her that I'm relevant. Uh, she wanted me to be a doctor, and a doctor to save lives. Um, and so uh, she had ambitions for me developing a cure for cancer, and for me the motivation of vehicle research is one, uh, particularly of safety. And the way that I argue it is that if you look at people that, that um, have died of cancer. There's a lot of people. It's a very um, pervasive problem in our society. And if you look at the number of people that might have died of vehicle fatalities, proportionally speaking, it's much less. And in fact, these the, the red and, and blue are uh, correct numbers based off of, of, of societal populations. But if you look at the number of years that people might lose in terms of cancer deaths, cancer tends to, to, to um, hit the elderly. And so you may lose two or three years of life expectancy, whereas when vehicle fatalities occur, they tend to hit us um, statistically around the, the middle of our, our lifespan. And so even though vehicle uh, fatalities are thankfully quite rare, the impact on society is as large as, as, as many cancers. And so solving issues with, in terms of transportation safety um, are ones equivalent to to uh, curing cancer. At least that's what I told my mother. Um, so I, I am here representing a group of uh, students and staff researchers that, that have worked with me over the years. Um, at this point, we have um, about 15 students that are affiliated with my group, down from about 22 last year. I'm joined today by Jesse Penser, who uh, um, was presenting with me some uh, autonomous vehicle work. And, uh, you know, these folks are the ones who really should be up here, and unfortunately it would be very crowded if all 15 here were presenting. And so you're going to see about uh, 10 thesis worth of, of 
of results. And I'm just going to summarize um, topically. Now, the theme of the presentation today is really how, when you look at the issues that um, pervade transportation, particularly transportation automation systems and driver systems, you really see interplays between vehicles, which are mechanical engineering discipline, um, stereotypically infrastructure, civil engineers, um, safety, which pervades many different areas, but we work primarily with human factors folks and site folks, and then logistics, which are often industrial engineers, at least at, at Penn State. And so you see very um, discipline-specific focus. And so to begin the talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about vehicles and infrastructure. Now, from a mechanical engineer's perspective, Generally, we assume that the infrastructure is a given, that, that the only purpose of the infrastructure is to provide something for the mechanical engineers to, to sell to you um, and, and we drive upon. And I'm going to try to motivate that a little bit differently. And I'm going to try to show you um, that there's interplay between these domains that, that you might not uh, be aware of. Um, what's ironic, though, is that uh, in the vehicle community, mechanical engineering, it still remains a key challenge to determine accurately the vehicle's position on the road which is a supreme irony when you think about the goal of a vehicle is to move from position to position. So not knowing position is obviously a, a severe issue, especially when it comes to automation. And the challenges include things like urban canyons that block a GPS signals, including uh, in Pennsylvania area tree canopies. And so we might lose GPS coverage on some of our roads by 50% of the traversal. And so it's not acceptable to have a road that, or a vehicle um, that can only follow 50% of the turns. Um, one of those terms might be uh, life ending. Um, the other thing that happens in Pennsylvania and Chicago is the lane markers disappear regularly, um, fairly predictably, around you know January, February, and they often don't come back until March or April, and we call that snow. Um, and so many vision-based systems that are trying to guide themselves off of features on the road surface are very much challenged from things like lack of lane markers or the inability or unobservability of those markers. Um, there have been many attempts, for example, to uh, augment the infrastructure and put things like magnetic markers, uh, strips in the road that we can find. Uh, the challenge with those, um, they work quite well in general, but the challenge is, one, they are expensive in terms of installation. Um, and two, even if they're there, in many cases, the presence of other vehicles or unexpected things around the road greatly diminish their performance. And so a magnetic field is very heavily distorted, for example, by the presence of other vehicles or from infrastructure that is uh, uh, ferromagnetic. So um, from a mechanical engineering perspective, uh, most mechanical engineers assume that the infrastructure is blatantly stupid and will never help you do anything. And so as a result, uh, most mechanical engineering research is based off of predicting the motion of the vehicle into the future. And that means we do a lot of differential equations. And so 90 percent plus of the work on vehicle automation um, on the mechanical engineering literature is, is solving differential equations as the vehicle drives around. Uh, we have a well-known one that we use. It's the one that's um, intrinsic to nearly every chassis safety program. It's called the bicycle model. It doesn't mean that the vehicle is modeled as a bicycle that you know, leans and you pedal. It means that we assume that the right side forces on the tires are this, about the same as the left side forces. And as a first approximation, that actually works really, really well. And the accuracy of this model is, is, tends to be quite high, you know, meaning we have a few percent error whenever we try to predict where the vehicle is going to go based off of your steering input. Now, one thing that's important to mention in this model um, is that it assumes that the infrastructure is completely flat. Okay? We always assume as mechanical engineers that there is nothing on the road that goes up, down, you know, leans right, leans left. Okay? We always assume a, a, a flat earth assumption, and that's something that's very relevant to the discussion that we're about to have. Now, whenever you have a model fit, you want to have some place to test the model. And with the model, what you do is you take an input, you bring it into the model, and then you take a measurement, bring it into the thing that you're trying to model, and compare them side by side. And make sure that they match. And if they match well, you've done well. Um, and for that, we have a test track. And, and Steve mentioned earlier that uh, he was over there. Um, it's not a great test track in the sense that I'd always want it to be about 10 to 100 times larger. Um, so uh, we'll be working on that. Uh, but it, it does allow us to do some interesting tests. Here's an example of me taking the family vehicle out for the last time um, on a snow surface to demonstrate um, how this model is particularly challenged whenever you're sliding the vehicle sideways. Um, and uh, what's interesting is if you look closely, I couldn't see out the front of the vehicle because of all the snow hitting it, so I rolled down the windows. And so that's actually snow going through the vehicle. Um, and the reason why it's the last time is one of my students took this picture and circulated on campus 
And by the time I got home, my wife knew about that. And uh, all the ice had frozen up against the rims of the wheels um, due to the heat of the brakes, and then it refroze. And it threw the wheels off balance um, until it got warm enough outside that that you know, remelted. And so we were driving this galloping car down the road for about three days. And so uh, we now have a standing promise in the Brennan household that um, any time the car goes out on the test track, my wife automatically gets a new car of her choice. <laughs> so, uh, needless to say, we've had other vehicles now out on the track since then. Now, one of the things about models is that we assume behavior that it's not extreme. We assume small inputs. Models tend to work very well as long as you don't have extreme inputs. I do a lot of research with vehicle rollover, and the purpose of us doing a lot of this modeling is to prevent vehicle accidents due to roadway departure that are, that are related to the vehicle skidding sideways, related to the vehicle rolling over. That's, that's where I started a lot of this analysis, and what grew my in, interest in uh, cross-collaboration with um, uh, outside fields. But let me show you what that model would look like. So this is um, shown in black is the relationship, like if you're steering, and you steer to the right and then steer to the left, um, this would be, for example, right and then left. Uh, the black predicts what the vehicle uh, would do. Now the blue is what we measure um, for that same maneuver. Okay? Now the measurement does not agree very well with, with the black line okay, at first go. And we spent about a year trying to understand why. Um, for those of you that don't recognize steering maneuvers, this is a, what's called a, a full sine wave. Um, maneuver. So what we do is literally a sine wave on your steering wheel. And if you don't believe me, you should go out on the road and try it. It gives you exactly a lane change. So every time you do a lane change, you change orientation with the first pulse of the sign. Then you turn back the other way to get realigned back where you're at. So you know, every time you do a sine wave, you're, you're actually changing lanes. So you'll see this a lot if you're a vehicle dynamicist. You see these, these sine waves. And we use this to test our models. Now, what baffled us for a year is that you know, this is a really simple model. We're doing very simple, low amplitude maneuvers. It should agree. We spent a lot of time calibrating the tire forces, measuring vehicle's inertial parameters, making sure that we had the steering measurements exactly right. Physics doesn't lie to you, generally. And so the fact that they disagreed really bothered us because that's a lot of disagreement. It's so much so that you can't warn the driver um, about impending rollover when you have a signal noise ratio that's like one. You know, there's so much noise on your measurement that you'll be constantly activating the airbags right and left. And so you have to wait for extreme events in order to, to intercede on the driver's behalf if your model is wrong. So what we did is we then started driving around and we realized that if we mark out this lane change maneuver with cones and we drove very, very slowly and did our lane change maneuver, we measured the, the, the roll amplitude as we did our slow lane change and then we went back to the beginning and we did our fast lane change where the vehicle's like really rocking and rolling. And we subtracted the low speed measurement off the high speed measurement as a function of position. We get that beautiful agreement that you see in red. Okay? That red matches the model. And what, you know, we're head scratching. Why does your position determine whether or not your, your model agrees? And so this is the first time where we really started becoming fascinated with civil engineering as mechanical engineers. Because that flat road assumption that we keep making over and over again is why our models don't agree. Okay, it's why that we can't have very, very high fidelity, high bandwidth roll control of a vehicle. Because we don't know what infrastructure that we're driving on. We don't know how the undulations of the road underneath us are affecting our own measurements. And by the way, this little disagreement right there between the red and the black at the very tip, that was a pothole that we happened to hit on one of the traversals that we missed on the other. I mean, we can see like little pothole divots in the vehicle in terms of the measurements we're getting off the road. And this is just production quality sensors. We're not doing anything crazy. Um, and, and yet we can, we can start seeing fidelity on the road surface that is just amazing. So then we went ahead and reprocessed all of our data the same way, and we get model fits that are just absolutely amazing. I mean, this is unheard of model fits um, in terms of vehicle dynamics community, in terms of signal noise ratio. And so now we, okay, this made us breathe easier. Physics is good. We don't have to worry about Newton anymore. And, and so we continued on with our control design. But this had us scratching our heads. Like if we see this effect at, um, you know, for a lane change maneuver, we still should see the effect for other maneuvers. And so we did a simple experiment. We have a circular um, handling area. It's not too large. And we drove circles around our skid pad over and over again. And we did it at different speeds, you know, 12 up to 30 miles an hour. And what we did is we then aligned our roll measurement, or pitch measurement in this case, as a function of our location along the circle, which is actually easy to do. You just take your compass reading and plot it as x. 
you take your pitch measurement plotted as y, and it gives you these, these cool plots. And lo and behold, they all live right on top of each other. Now, the skin pad is something that's designed to be flat, and yet the vehicle can see small undulations and things like how the road was sloped for drainage in terms of the water runoff of the road. And it's something that, as a driver, you just have no perception of. And yet the vehicle can readily see this as a disturbance pattern on its behavior. And so those little undulations that you have on your seat as you drive around are something that the vehicle can readily see. Um, and it creates a, a fingerprint of the road. And so uh, once we have um, this effect, we said, well, OK, everybody's assumed that this effect has been zero for 40 years now. Okay. What, how big is this effect? So we then went out, and I'll show you in a, a little bit how we did this, but we digitally measured the road geometry for a straight line highway drive. You just drive it on the lane for 10 miles. And then you look at the amplitude of the roll signal, and that's shown on the, um, uh, on the right. We even simulated it. That's the red plot. Um, and confirmed that our simulations of the vehicle driving on this same geometry would give us the same effect. So we're not getting any artifacts from our sensors. And then we compare them side by side with that lane changing maneuver. And if you look at the amplitude, you driving down the road, and the road tilting right or left, depending on which way we want to drain the water off the road, is giving as large a signal in terms of your roll dynamics as is a lane change maneuver. Okay? And that's phenomenal. I mean, basically, the steering input of your vehicle is as large as the input from the road tilt, you know, right and left. Okay? And that's something that nobody has ever taught or discussed. Um, when I was uh, a student in vehicle dynamics, nor in any of the textbooks that I teach from. Okay, and so that was the first time where I really got an appreciation that civil engineers have as much control over the vehicle as do the drivers. Okay, and so at this point, um, we had some really cool ideas. Uh, one idea was that if we can measure this deviation from our model, we can take that measurement, we can take a map of all these deviations, which we've been measuring, and we can say, Maybe if we have the measurement and we have the map, we can figure out where the vehicle is on the road, even in tree canopies or in tunnels or any place where you shut off GPS. Maybe I can take a measurement of how the vehicle is doing this, use it as a fingerprint to look up where the vehicle is on the road. And what the problem with that is it's, it's not what's called mathematically one-to-one. -one. What that means is if I have a roll measurement and I measure like two degrees, I can't go into my little lookup table and say, okay, two degrees means that I'm on the corner of uh, Main Street and University Drive. Um, it's because there's a lot of roads that have a two degree measurement. In fact, hundreds of thousands of them. Okay, and so how do I take patterns of measurements and get, um, generate a position on the road? So the way we do it is we take a map that in this case, let's say it's a hill, just so that you can mentally um, uh, imagine this. This is a hill, we're going to take a hill, we, we don't know where we are, we're just going to put a bunch of guesses of where we are on the road. And then what we're going to do first is we're going to take a pitch measurement of the, of the vehicle. And so how, how is the vehicle leaning at this particular point? All the measurements that agree with our pitch measurement, we're going to give them more weight. Okay, we call this a, a particle filter. Um, those measurements then are allowed to continue living. The ones that disagree, we kill. Okay, and we allow some deviation on either side because we're going to have a lot of sensor noise, as, as, as you've seen in, in the data. Then what we do is we drive forward just a little bit more. Okay, and we propagate our guesses forward on the map by about the same amount of distance as, as we measured on the, on the wheel sensor going forward. We then take another measurement. We then kill off the ones that disagree. And we just keep doing this over and over again. And what you see is you see the population of all the guesses that you have on the road converge to a position on the road that is a good estimate of where you are. So what do you need to do this? You need a sensor that's already on the vehicle, a pinch sensor, and you need a map. Okay? And you need a little microprocessor that can run this algorithm. And so if you implement this um, in practice, this is our test track. Um, and Steve, you'll appreciate it. Our test track is not like hills and mountains. I mean, it's, it's a flat test track. Um, and so this is all of the guesses of where we could be. And what we're going to do is we're going to drive around the test track. And we're going to see how those, those guesses um, change over time. And it won't let me do this because I've got my legs cut. Undo my laser. Go forward. Here we go. So what you see is the estimates converge onto the true value, which is shown in the in the um, square. And the average of all my estimates, we call them particles, is the circle. And they lock on with an error of about 20 to 10 to 20 centimeters. 
So the undulation under the vehicle, that rocking back and forth, gives you a fingerprint of the road that is accurate enough that I can tell you, at least in the direction that you're traveling, not right and left, but in the direction that you're traveling, I can tell you which lane and how far you are along within lane within about 10 centimeters. And that's profound because one of the key challenges of automation is that if I block your, your camera signal, I block your GPS, I don't know where the vehicle is and I can't robustly automate the vehicle. It's further profound in the sense that once I have that information, I can start telling you where to expect things like collisions, where to expect things, to expect things like rollover hazards nearby the road. Um, and so we're going to use that information. We've even confirmed that the sensor can work with commercial grade sensors. We first did this with um, the best sensor that we have, is with the, which is a ring laser gyro. And uh, we've even run it, for those of you that are familiar with system theory, um, we even did this with a, what's called a, an extended common filter. Uh, and in this case, we have um, uh, a GPS lock. Then we shut off GPS, and we can confirm that we stay locked. Now, the neat thing about an extended common filter is instead of keeping these hundreds of thousands of estimates of where we can be, we only keep one, and we keep moving that estimate back to the, the position that most agrees. Now, it assumes that you're always going to stay close to the correct answer in your map, but whenever the map has enough information, it will push you back to the correct answer. And so that's, that's the basic of, of this algorithm. And that's important because this algorithm is simple enough that you can run off of a, a, an ECU in a, in a vehicle, you know, a, a $5 microprocessor. So, I've shown you how the interactions with vehicles and infrastructure can give us some information, especially back to vehicles, uh, that has been ignored to this point. And so now I'm going to talk about how we can use that information, for example, to increase safety. Now, um, once we start going out and modeling the vehicle's behavior to these you know, road undulations, uh, we had a project, in this case this was at CHRP 2221, where we were looking at the effect of median geometry, the way that you build the shoulders and, and median structures within the road, on accident outcomes. And particularly, there's concern about a vehicle going into a median, ramping up the other side and having a head-on collision. And the question was, how much money should we spend on barriers that go inside the median to prevent you know, these types of head-on collisions, because they're horrendous? Um, where should those barriers be located? Okay, and, and what's the trade-off? Like, how, What's the improvement in safety that, that, that could happen? Now, I know that I'm not supposed to use the word safety. I'm, my civil engineer colleagues and my safety colleagues always uh, get on me. But I hope you understand what I mean when I say safety. We're talking about preventing um, uh, uh, accidents or potential accidents. Now, a mechanical engineer's perspective on how to do this is that I have a beautiful vehicle simulation model. I'm going to basically put the geometry and simulation for a bunch of different um, uh, median widths a bunch of different slope designs. Um, I can even do trapezoidal geometries in the median instead of V-shaped geometries. I can try all sorts of things. And so we did about 200,000 simulations. It took three or four months of us to run and then another about the same amount of time to process all the data out of these simulations. Um, and then we compared things like how often did the vehicle get into a skid situation sideways that it would generate a soil trip rollover. How many times did the vehicle roll over um, in our simulation? How many times did it go into oncoming traffic and would have resulted in a head-on collision, which you can figure out statistically. Okay, so we did these simulations and then we said, all right, we now know for passenger cars, pickups, and SUVs, the proportion of times that those vehicles rolled over in our simulation in terms of percents of all rollover. Like in this case, 35% uh, of the rollovers that we observed were from SUVs. We then went to the crash databases that we had available. Um, in this case, it was the Nizza rollover uh, database for, I think at this point, it was about 2,000 crashes. And we were actually compared the percentages, okay? Perfect agreement is that 45 degree line that you see here. And what we plotted is the simulation results versus the database. In this case, it's on the, uh, on the right. And you see, like, for SUVs, we almost nailed it. We know, like, for a particular type of vehicle, the way that you build the vehicle and the way that it handles, how often it will roll over as a percentage of all vehicles on the road. Similarly, we said, based off of different slope geometries, how often should you have a rollover event as a percentage versus a cross-median collision, like it goes into the oncoming traffic. The point that I'm trying to make is they agree beautifully. Like, we can tell you if you build a vehicle and given this geometry, this is how often these types of accidents will occur, and, and they seem to agree with data. Now, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, let me give you a tip as a driver. Um, this is an example of, of a situation where, in the bottom case, a driver has gone off the road in the white vehicle, tries to steer aggressively back onto the road, and what ends up happening 
is the vehicle hits the back uh, swale and then ends up ro rolling over. Okay, and, and that's bad. The driver in the yellow car does nothing. It's the hands-off driver, the sleepy driver, the drunk driver that just drives straight off the road. Okay? The red vehicle is one that tries to drive to the middle of the median, tries to keep the vehicle in the middle of the swale as much as possible. Okay? Each of these outcomes is very, very different. And not only that, the way that you hit the barrier in the middle, like if you put up a barrier, is very different. In some cases, you have a head-on collision. In some cases, you have a side swipe or even a tail swipe condition. And these have tremendous impacts on the outcomes of accidents in terms of their severity. And so this is something that really is not considered in the way that we test barrier designs. Okay, we always do frontal impacts for, for our barriers because it's you know, unethical to put drivers in vehicles and then drive in that barriers to test them. Okay, so um, if you remember nothing else, if you're a driver and you happen to go off the road because your vehicle spins out or something, do not try to steer back to the road. Okay, there's two reasons for that. One, the vehicle will often go on a slope and generate a side slip condition and cause a rollover. Now, rollovers at highway speeds are very dangerous, about 45% fatal. Okay, so do not do that. Two, the second reason is if you hit a barrier, your vehicle has been optimized for a frontal collision. So you taking your hands off the vehicle and just letting it do what it wants to do is the best thing that you, you could probably do. Now, if you're really smart, you'll try to steer toward the bottom of the, of the, of the median. We found that that's the best case uh, situation uh, for you to do. Um, that's also very relevant from the standpoint of vehicle safety. If I know the geometry of what's around the vehicle on the road, I can lock the steering wheel for you. If I know that you've left the road, I will block you from steering. I will literally prevent the steering wheel from moving so that you're forced to commit and thereby potentially save lives. And this is about 2,000 deaths a year that we could save just by not letting you steer when you go off the road under, under severe situations. Now, all of this mapping looks pretty cool, and so this is where I'm going to start showing the cool videos, because that's what you have to do on the presentation track. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned how to do in all of this is how to uh, mount a uh, laser system to the back of the vehicle, drive down the road, and generate measurements of geometry. Um, we also collect a, a, a movie or a forward-looking camera picture of what the uh, road should look like, and we can superimpose the two. So the superimposed plots are in the top. And the thing that I'm trying to point out to you is the agreement between this 3D representation of a geometry and your forward-looking camera, it's amazing. Like, you can drive through, like, these virtual environments like a video game. Okay, you don't really need that forward camera anymore. Okay, and the beauty about that is that if you want to drive a vehicle remotely, and, and Jesse, in, in fact, has, been, has worked on like Mars rover algorithms, if you want to drive the, a vehicle remotely, you don't need to stream a video camera stream to the driver. You can just say, do you have a map? Yes. Do you trust that map and there's not very many people around that area, like on the moon? Um, yes. Then maybe all I need to do is give you the position and orientation of the vehicle on the map, and I will let you augmented reality, look at that and drive the vehicle from that, that perspective. And so there's some really neat and interesting opportunities for automation in terms of taking infrastructure-based information and tying it with, with driver automation algorithms. And so indeed, we've taken that strategy, we've put it in, um, in this case, a, a tractor trailer, using nothing but a low-cost camera, um, a, a you know, normal GPS system, um, a, a sensor to determine orientation of the vehicle and our map. And what we're trying to do is, is as you drive around, we can create a heads-up display that, for example, in red, denotes the edge of the roadway. We can give you another warning that says, if you depart the roadway, you will have a rollover accident right here. Or you will have a frontal collision accident right here. And so the vehicle is getting smart enough so that if you have to make a life or death decision at the last minute, it will help you decide whether or not you are going to have that frontal collision or if there are paths nearby you that can prevent um, an accident outcome. Okay, so that's a really, really neat thing. Um, the other thing that we can do is, as I mentioned, you can do an augmented reality display where in the case of snow, we can match the terrain profile to what you see and we can put lane markers on top of your vehicle at the right location. Okay, so we can put a heads-up display um, in front of you where we can tell you where everything is supposed to be. And this works um, remarkably well, as you can see here. Uh, in this case, we're driving through a forested area. Um, this is a great example of a location that would not have GPS during, during the summer months with the leaf canopy. Um, it is also one where we can use that geometry that we see in our map, 
we can look at the geometry that we can see in what's called a stereoscopic camera system. We can match the two, and I know what road is coming up. That is another way of, for me to figure out position and matching. Now, um, there are ways that we can um, uh, uh, combine these algorithms. Um, uh, one of those is what's called the internal model principle. It means that if you have an automation algorithm and you know what the world is, you can put the world into your algorithm, um, and we're going to call that a map, and you can design an algorithm around that. Uh, I call this a merge model. Um, I don't know that we have a name for um, an algorithm that has the map in play. Um, the problem with this approach, which is typically solved for those of you that are vehicle dynamicists, um, in an approach that's called SLAM, Simultaneous Localization Mapping, is it's computationally intensive, it's a lot of data moving around, you have to have a really good PC or a GPU sitting here. And our goal was to figure out some really simple algorithms that could be implemented on a vehicle. Um, the way that we simplified the problem is rather simple. To the vehicle, the vehicle, vehicle we assume is very egocentric, and it assumes that the, the entire world is traveling toward it, and everything you see is eventually going to go by you. Okay? And it's going to go by you at approximately the same speed that you're moving. Okay? It's not really a profound statement. Okay, and so what we do is we discretize the world out ahead of you as potential points that you're going to be at in time. And we look at how those points are going towards you, and we match the map with um, the measurements that you see in your camera to better figure out which direction you're pointing and how fast you're moving, how fast you're sliding sideways, because those are the critical things for automation. Now, um, semantically, it basically means that we look out ahead in terms of time, which creates a decimation that gets tighter and tighter and tighter as you look out toward the, the vanishing line. And then we, we basically assume that the road is going to move toward you. Now when we do that, it allows us to use a very simple algorithm. In this case, we have a camera that is looking out ahead of the vehicle. It is looking at just one lane strike in this case. Um, and figuring out where that lane strike, which is that blue ball, kind of agrees with the map. And the reason I'm, I like this video is because we're doing it at night. The lane stripe is not always visible, but because it has a map of where the lane stripe should be, it can do a Bayesian inference at every single point that it sees the map to determine if it trusts the map or trusts its measurement. And then it does a Bayesian fusion of the two pieces of data and then keeps fusing that closer and closer to the vehicle. So by the time the map gets underneath the vehicle, you know the position of the vehicle very, very accurately. And allows us to do neat things, like in terms of the vehicle algorithm, such as uh, predicting where the vehicle um, is going to be in terms of the future. Now, these are plots of an algorithm that's called a column filter in red. That's the typical algorithm that determines uh, where a vehicle is on the road. And the blue algorithm, which is the map-based approach. And you can see uh, in black, which is actually quite difficult to see, is the truth measurement that we get from a differential GPS system. And in this case, you can see that the map gives you almost differential GPS accuracy with a low-cost camera. So we're talking about a $100 unit now that can give you centimeter, even sub-centimeter level um, accuracy. So uh, differential GPS generally has an accuracy of about one to two centimeters um, uh, in terms of its uh, one sigma accuracy. So you know that's really, really encouraging. Um, the beauty of this approach as well is that we can see how our error changes in our algorithm as a function of how far out ahead that we look and as a function of, of our camera, like how good are the eyes on the vehicle. So if you have rain, we can tell it to slow down. We know how far to trust our measurement out ahead. If you have um, a windshield that hasn't been cleaned, we can pre-calculate pre how that is going to correspond to errors in the vehicle motion. And these are types of calculations that really are difficult to do with current algorithms. And this is what I've been working on a lot this past year. Um, and we find that if you look about what drivers do, about 20 or 30 meters out ahead of the vehicle, you do pretty well. You get almost all the performance benefits as you would looking almost out to the horizon in terms of the way that the vehicle tracks. And so it's very nice when you have like a mathematical analysis in a model and you get a result that matches intuition. It, it, it's uh, encouraging. So um, the other thing that's nice about it is that there's a lot of situations where current algorithms simply don't work. A um, good example of that is fog. You, you really don't have a lot of features in the world. You don't know where you are from the, from the vehicle perspective. If you shut off the vehicle and turn it back on, it would be completely lost. But as long as you have a rough map of where you are, um, it tends to work. And I say rough map because we don't really know where we are longitudinally um, on the road. Even a rough GPS would be like three meters. I can run my terrain matching algorithm getting it down to maybe 20 centimeters, but I have to drive for a while to do that. 
Now, um, and this algorithm only needs a little bit of information about um, uh, lateral position on the road. Uh, the other thing, too, is that the error in your cameras tends to go to infinity as you get to the vanishing point. We can design the steering controller to be most sensitive to um, what's called the lateral offset um, close to the vehicle so that it's trying to steer more aggressively from information close to the vehicle. That's, this amplitude is how aggressively it's using that information. Um, you want that amplitude to become zero when your sensor becomes in a large error. So the sensor error becomes large well far away from the vehicle in this case, um, a preview time of about one and a half seconds. Close to the vehicle where the sensor has a pretty good view of the roadway, you want it to use that information aggressively to steer. And so it's neat because this algorithm does that. Now, the other thing that's, that's interesting in terms of the interplay is that position. We can look to see how the corrections take place, and we find that there are certain portions of the road that always make the algorithm fail. Now, how many people here have algorithms on their vehicle that are lane trackers? Well, actually, I should ask, how many people here own a vehicle? Okay, and that's scary, so I'm like, I'm not used to asking that question. Um, so the, oh, by the way, for the audience um, online, uh, it was only maybe, I would say, 70% of the people have a vehicle. How many people here have a vehicle that has lane tracking? I just purchased a new one, and I made a point of getting one. The irony is that there's one spot nearby my house where the lane markers are very poorly done, and they diverge because somebody sneezed or something when they're making the lanes. And the lanes do this, and then they come back together. And invariably, my car just beep, 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 and it just yells at us, so much so at the same point every single time we have to shut the algorithm off. Now, that's something that's simply not acceptable to the human user, so I'm a vehicle dynamicist shutting off a safety system on my vehicle. It's complete irony. Um, the other thing is that an automation system has to stop the vehicle at that point, and it's just unacceptable to do that. We can identify locations where that would happen based off of areas where the error suddenly becomes large um, in our system, and so we can uh, accommodate that um, accordingly. So finally, let me, let me start talking about something that's interesting in terms of logistics. There's a lot of traffic modeling people, I think, in the room, people that understand things like congestion patterns. And I want to talk about how some of these vehicle dynamic models can, can uh, give us some information on how to set up like intelligent transportation. Now, the interesting thing about how a mechanical engineer approaches a congestion problem is we model a single vehicle or cluster vehicles as differential equations. We look to see how they interact with each other. We can instantiate things like the GM fourth model in terms of headway keeping um, on the vehicle. And that tells us how the drivers can accelerate or decelerate based on how much space the, he or she sees out in front of and so what's interesting is that when you start doing these very large groups of vehicles together, and in, in the, our model you might have, you know, if you have 100 vehicles, you might have a 200 order differential equation that you're trying to solve. You find that these models start to give you very low order dynamics that have oscillation. They, they tend to form clusters of vehicles. And we have a name for this kind of low order clustering. It's called a traffic jam. Okay? When vehicles get too tightly cl uh, clustered together, too coupled in terms of their dynamics, they start emerging behavior that is unexpected um, and often negative. Now, if you're a school of fish, you do want to form a traffic jam because you look like a big whale to a, a shark, I'm sure, and the shark's not going to attack you. Um, whereas if you're a vehicle, I don't like being you know, a whale of a vehicle on the road because it means I don't get here on time for, for my seminar. <coughs> Uh, we see these patterns of, of clustering and then free flow and then clustering and then free flow in terms of time um, versus position uh, in, our, in our models. And so one of the things that we've learned how to do as mechanical engineers is how do we extract that observed low order behavior from the models and what can we learn from them. Now when we do that, we can change the driver algorithm, how aggressively a driver behaves in terms of how they keep that space in front of them open or how, how quickly they close it. We assume that human drivers don't pay attention and that when there's an open space, they're very aggressive about closing it. They don't want anybody else in their space in front of them. We assume that we've designed computer-based driving systems, automated cruise control systems, such that they're much more forgiving and, and, and try to optimize the flow of the vehicle. When we compare the mixture of human vehicles to computer-controlled vehicles, we find that computer-controlled vehicles, or well-behaved humans, have the potential of increasing the throughput of the highway by a factor of three before you get self-organized traffic jam behavior. So those idiots that you see swerving out ahead of you on, on uh, I-90, um, they're potentially reducing the traffic throughput by a factor of three. The 
other inference that we see is that if you have an entire row um, or grouping of these computer controlled vehicles, um, and they're, you're getting, let's say, three times the traffic throughput today as you were 10 years ago because of that, once that human jumps on the road and acts very swervy, the sensitivity to causing another traffic jam is increased by a factor of 10. So that's the trade-off you get. You get three times as many vehicles, at least according to this analysis, with automation um, algorithms or well-behaved humans. But you get 10 times the sensitivity to bad stuff happening when you get that disturbance that comes in that's unexpected in terms of the dynamics. Okay? And that's, we call that a waterbed effect in, in automation theory. You get some good, you get some bad. Okay, and so it's important to understand that trade-off. The other thing that's also wickedly cool about this is that many of you know, and this is one of the most frustrating things about a traffic jam, is once you're in a traffic jam, there is nothing you can do to get out of it. Okay? I, I hope all of you, even those that don't own vehicles, know that. Okay? So uh, there's not much that you can change in terms of your performance. You also know that if a traffic jam is 100 miles ahead of you, it doesn't really matter how you drive because you're not going to have any influence on the... the the, the mitigation of that traffic jam. You should suspect that there is some behavior that you have as you approach the traffic jam where you can make the traffic jam worse in terms of how aggressive you are or better depending on how you, you merge into the traffic jam in terms of your behavior. So what we found is that there's different regions for each of these behaviors. There's a region in the jam region where you can do nothing. There's a region so far out ahead that you can do anything. We call that the null region. And there's a region in the middle that we call the influential subspace. Now, what we're assuming is in the future, if a vehicle enters a traffic jam, it can send a signal to the infrastructure and say, there is a jam right here. Everybody behind me, please change your behavior because that will make the jam go away. You know, pretty please. Again, this is one of those things where you have to be altruistic. Once you hit the jam, your behavior is not going to affect anybody um, in terms of your own benefit. It's only affecting people behind you. And so we're trying to figure out a way to make vehicles altruistic. And one of the things that's neat is that you can use um, the fundamental diagram of, of traffic flow to predict where do those vehicles, those influential people that you want to warn, where should they be relative to the jam? Like how much infrastructure should you have? Should you do vehicle to vehicle communication that's like hundreds of meters? Should you be going into like a cell tower that's doing like maybe miles? Or should you, do you need to communicate 20 miles? And what's neat is you can find from the equations that if you communicate too closely behind you from a connected vehicle that's shown here in red and um, a, another connected vehicle too behind you that's going to slow down a little bit on approach to the jam, realize that the slope of each one of these lines is the speed of the vehicle. Um, so I can take a vehicle that would normally be traveling at this slope, tell it to slow down a little bit on approach to the jam, and hopefully mitigate the jam. You'll find that, that that slowed down vehicle creates a slow traffic pattern that's not jammed behind it, but is now slower. And, but warning this particular driver didn't do anything. The original jam shown in J still continues right out, and so you just basically had a vehicle that you warned that just joined the jam anyway. There is a neat area that if you warn the vehicle far enough in advance, that that slowed down group of vehicles actually minimizes the jam time. So I show here in this triangle, this dotted line, this is how far the original jam would have lasted. Because that one driver slowed down a little bit on approach, you've now you shortened your, the traffic jam. Can you turn your pointer back on, actually? It's not... Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's not highlighted. Um, okay, so this dotted line right here is where the traffic jam originally would have, be, would have been. This S is the slowed down slug of vehicles that's behind a connected vehicle that's now driving slower than it would have had with the warning. And at this point, a connected vehicle entered a jam, communicated back behind it to another vehicle saying, slow down, there's a jam, okay, coming up. So this slowed down vehicle, because they slowed down, has changed a jam that would have stopped here in time, and now it stops here. They shaved off some portion of time in the jam. So you can imagine, that connected vehicles have the potential of slowing uh, uh, vehicles down. So, and there's a region of which that influence grows and shrinks. And so, um, one of the things I want to point out is that if you communicate so far out ahead of the vehicle, in this case this is kilometers, five kilometers ahead of this particular jam, I think this is a simulation, it's 100 cars. Um, in this case, it doesn't help any. And so what's neat is you can start plotting what's called this influential subspace. 
If you communicate about half a kilometer ahead, it helps. If you communicate up to four and a half kilometers ahead, it helps. Anything closer than half a kilometer, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many billboards you have slow down and traffic jam coming. It does help from things like rear collisions, okay, but it's not going to help in terms of, of uh, um, uh, mitigating the traffic jam. And so that's important from the standpoint of infrastructure because you can look at expected sizes of traffic jams and figure out where that event horizon is. And I use the word event horizon just like a black hole. Once you get within the event horizon and you're a vehicle, you have now entered a black hole of automation where nothing you do is going to change the world around you. You're stuck. You're going to get in the traffic jam. If you step outside of the, the event horizon, now you have some influence on whether or not that black hole goes away, which we call a traffic jam, or whether or not that black hole gets bigger. Okay? And we, um, as mechanical engineers and traffic engineers, we do not have very good tools for determining where that traffic jam is. All right, so let me wrap up here real quick and give you some of the themes. And I'll talk about some of the open challenges here in the next uh, five minutes or so about what I've seen. Um, one of the things that you've seen is we use a lot of location-specific services, which we call maps, um, to help the driver. Um, we see an interplay between vehicles, logistics, infrastructure, and safety that also have a map theme. Um, we are now in a situation where, I wish the laser point, pointer would let me um, play movies. Uh, we're now in a situation where I can put lane markers and augmented reality displays